We're going to get to our lesson tonight and uh, in Psalm, one, uh, Psalm 51. Uh, this is the first step heavenward. Uh, here in Psalm 51, it is a, uh, a genuine prayer of repentance. Uh, you know, we talk, we, I believe in repentance. Uh, and I believe that in order for a person to be saved, they have to have the, they have to follow or they must follow the order if they're going to receive salvation if they're going to receive the holy ghost they have to be forgiven of their sin in order to be forgiven of their sins they've got to ask for forgiveness and we know that psalm 51 is a prayer of david after he would uh, he was confronted by the prophet nathan and said thou art the man uh, David, even though you're a king, you're guilty. Oh, hallelujah. Uh, Psalm 51, and starting at verse 1 through 19. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquities, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgression and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward part and in the hidden parts, Thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, thou God of my salvation. And my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. Do good in thy good pleasure unto Zion. Build thou the walls of Jerusalem. Then shalt thou be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then shall they offer bullocks upon thy altar. Hallelujah. Let's just love the Lord one more time before you're seated. Thank you, Jesus, for the word. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, God, thank you. Lord, for what you're doing in this place, in our hearts tonight. One more time, oh God, your servant ask that you would quicken our hearts. Oh Lord, let your anointing of God be in this place. Hallelujah. We just give you praise in your awesome and mighty name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Put your notes down, put your Bibles down, and let's clap our hands unto the Lord. Hallelujah. Magnify Jesus. Exalt the name. Jesus. Hallelujah. You may be seated. And uh, there's a couple things I want to outline that kind of goes with tonight and next week. Uh, tonight, I'm covering six things. What repentance is not. Next week, I'll cover five things which 
what repentance is. But in this 51st Psalm, we see this as a prayer of genuine repentance. He says, have mercy. Calling out to the Lord in repentance, we have to recognize that we need mercy. I mean, God, instead of blotting out our sin, would just blot out us. But have mercy on me. David says, wash me. And then in verse 3, he acknowledges what he's done. He acknowledged his transgression. He acknowledged that the sin that he committed is ever going to be before him. The, that baby that was conceived in sin, even though it did not live, it died. And that was going to ever be for, before him. The sin of, of, of adultery committed with Bathsheba is ever going to be before him and his kingdom. The death of Uriah, his right-hand man, was going to be ever before him. It, you know, it's something that he can't block out of his memory, nor can he blot it out of the memory of Israel as a nation. And yet here, we see that if he does not acknowledge his transgression, all he's doing is making a confession, I'm sorry I got caught. And that is not repentance. People can shed tears, and it, it seems that they can be remorseful, but they're only sorry because they got caught. But we see that David in verses three to verse six, that when you read it, if it were, without the understanding and the knowledge, this would only be a, an excuse for what he did. But David is not making an excuse for what he did. He's asking God to take what he's done, take the wrong, and make it right. And the only way he knows that he can make it right is put truth back into the N word part. And you notice these key words from verse 7 on. Purge me, make me, hide thy face, create in me, cast me not away, restore to me the joy of thy salvation, and I will teach transgressors. Other people who are sinners just like him to steer away from the path of doing wrong. Deliver me. And then I'll open my mouth. My lips will show forth thy praise. Oh, hallelujah. You see, deep in the heart of every human being, there, in their soul, there is a hunger to be at peace with his creator and to make heaven the eternal home. Heaven is not uh, a goal in itself. It is our final destination. And while we're here, we want to keep in the insight of heaven as our eternal destiny. But as we're going this way, we need to make sure that we're living righteously. We're living godly. We're living a life that is pleasing unto the Lord. You know, a person can attempt to cover up his hunger with worldly entanglements, or he can choose to act upon it. Since it was God who originally placed that hunger within mankind. God has proven over and over, time and time again, that he will do his part if we will do our part. He has made a way. He made a plan for salvation. He made a way for our redemption from the fall of Adam in the Garden of Eden to John the Revelator put down his pen. The Bible has a testimony of God's willingness to provide a way for mankind to be saved, a way of escape from penalty of sin and death. We can be more than conquerors, hallelujah. We can be overcomers through Christ Jesus. Even though God has provided all that we need for salvation, Every searching, hungry soul is going to be held accountable and responsible to respond to the very grace of God through repentance. 
God has commanded every person to repent of his sins, renouncing them and turning from them to God. Repentance is clear in the scriptures. Uh, today, a lot of humanistic and secular cultures have uh, effectively blurred and diluted and compromised both uh, the, the will of uh, and the definition and the necessity for repentance. But God's word is true. God's word has not changed regardless of what the secularists believe. Regardless of what the culture says, God's word stands true today. Regardless of what our culture wants to convey to us, a, every human being, every person, every individual must bow a knee and confess not just with their lips, but they must make a true confession, repentant. The scripture re clearly reveals the necessity of salvation for a person to make it into heaven. A person must demonstrate faith in God. A person must demonstrate the faith in God's word by repenting of his sins, submitting to water baptism in the name of Jesus. And if you have not been baptized in the name of Jesus, you have not been baptized. You may have been in the water, you may have been sprinkled, whatever, but that you have not been baptized correctly. But by being submitting yourself to the name of Jesus for the remission of sin, then receiving the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in the other tongues as the Scripture says, as the Spirit of God you'll give the utterance. You, uh, Acts chapter 2, 37, verse 38. And tonight, over the next couple weeks, we will be looking at what, uh, as far as repentance. And tonight, what repentance is not. Repentance is not reformation. A reformation is the act of reforming. The state of being reformed. And by the same source of the Merriam-Webster's Collegiate Dictionary, reform means being changed for the better. You know, every honest person realizes that there are things in his life that he could do better. But however, regardless how much a person attempts to enact upon those changes, he is not able to. Just think about it. every New Year's Day or New Year's Eve, people get their paper out and begin to write down things that are going to change about themselves, things that they're going to change in the new year. It's called the New Year's Revolution. Resolution. Because they're going to revitalize themselves. They resolve to lose weight, to clean house, to clean out the clutter, to get rid of everything that's hindering them. Some people say, I'm going to be a better Christian. Well, if they rely upon themselves, it's not going to happen. Uh, most New Year's resolutions only exist about or last about uh, seven days. And uh, within that seven days, the majority of those people have already broke their resolution within the first seven hours of the New Year. And that's only because part of the New Year's resolution they suck away. So, I mean, that day. Um, the multitudes of people uh, have this great ambition for reformation. Without the power of God working in them, they soon discover that the spiritual reformation is more difficult than just deciding to change. Every morning I get up, I decide that I'm going to lose 100 pounds today. I get up every morning deciding that I've started a 
40 day fast and it lasts just this day. And I may, get, may make it to break or the first hour at work. Uh, and there's sometimes I make a commitment that has a genuine commitment that I will fast. But if it's just about fasting to get my weight under control or to get my metabolism firing up, uh, you know, I've stopped by the health food store every now and then and get this stuff that, you know, a, it, what's called encouragement. You know, Joshua is a great guy and, and a very knowledgeable young man. He said, this is what you need and, you know, and this will help you know, keep you focused and on track. Yeah. Yeah, I'll drink this stuff for a couple days and it's like, I just hate the stuff that I would rather get something that's already dissolved and shake it up and it tastes good and instead of mixing it up and it's like, that takes time. Well, you know what? Change does not happen overnight. It takes time. Spiritual change still is a work in process. Uh, mankind, if change and reformation was the answer, there would be no need of a Savior. And if there was no need of a Savior, there would be no need of a God to come down to give His life for mankind. If it was about reformation. But I'm so glad that God sent His only Son, Jesus Christ, into the world. God made flesh. God came to be seen. And his way of escape was to, for him to give up his life that I might live. Repentance will do the needed spiritual work in us that reformation could never achieve. Repentance is not works. The Bible says much about our spiritual works. The scriptures are clear that a person cannot gain salvation by works alone. Uh, contrary to many people's thinking, spiritual works are supposed to be accompanying the, the life of the believer. You know, the, the works is part of that thing, the, the stuff that follows a believer. It's that spiritual sign that they are a believer. Jesus said uh, that these that uh, receive the Holy Ghost, there will be signs and wonders following. So how do they know that you're a believer? Well, there's some signs and wonders that follow. One of the greatest signs and wonder that follows is not so much about people that can, are able to do great miracles. But one of the signs is that there's this love for one another. We will be known by our love toward, not those who love us, but toward those who are unlovable and those who don't love us. You know, it's a, a rude awakening when we, for a young person, because they're surrounded by people that think they're the greatest and they're, they've got all this love that's dripping and drooling over them all day long and then they walk into the real world and find out not everybody out there in the real world loves them. You know, I, I, you know, I have this complex because I think everybody loves me. And then I find out those people that they're out there that don't love me. But after a believer has experienced the new birth, he is able to grow spiritually. He's able to cultivate good works in his life. Paul wrote that the believers are created to walk or to live with good works. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Jesus never condemned the performance of good works, but he did condemn the hypocrisy that was demonstrated by some who attempted to impress others by their good works. Oh, look at the clothes that I wear, and look how the, the good deeds, and look what I do. But see, Jesus saw behind the facade. He saw their hypocrisy. The Pharisees in Jesus' time 
uh, we're religious people who appear to be righteous and yet we see that uh, outwardly and publicly uh, they did all these great works but Jesus condemned them for their pretense and Matthew chapter 23 verses 3 through 5 says all therefore whosoever they bid you observe that observe and do but do not ye after their works for they say and not and do not for they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne and lay them on men's shoulders but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers but all their works they do for to be seen of men they make broad their uh, phylacrophies and enlarge their borders of their garments Titus chapter 3 and verse 5 says not by works of righteousness which we have done but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost you see repentance is an integral part to salvation it's not the work of flesh if it were just mere human work, a pure person would not need the convincing power of the Holy Ghost to draw him to repentance. Paul also demonstrated the spiritual nature of repentance when he used the life of Esau. Now we know that Esau and Jacob were twins. They were brothers. And there was this brother rivalry that went on. Jacob was the mother's favorite pet. Esau, the favorite pet of his daddy. And yet, Paul used Esau and Jacob in an object lesson. In Hebrews chapter uh, 12, verse 17. For we know that afterward, when he ha would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Repentance is not a work of the flesh. If it were, Esau would have achieved it through his intense effort with his tears. Repentance begins with the drawing of the Spirit of God and it culminates in a complete change of direction by penitent. We see that repentance means to take a uh, about face. It means to do, turn a 180 degree turn. You're walking north and you stop and you go south. Or if you're going east, you stop and you're going west. Repentance means you're stopping your tracks and you're making a total change about direction. A re repentance is not baptism. Baptism in water in the name of Jesus Christ is essential to salvation. A person cannot substitute baptism for true repentance. That's why it's important before a person is baptized in water through immersion even if they're back being baptized in the name of Jesus they must repent first now like I mentioned uh, uh, Thursday night the length of repentance is not important some people pray short prayers of repentance some others pray long prayers and they shed many tears but whether it's a long prayer or a short prayer, whether they shed, shed a few tears or many tears, what is necessary that they repent, generally asking God to forgive them. That's what's important. And baptism is to wash away those sins that they committed now that they repented over. That's why 
You know, a person can receive the Holy Ghost without being baptized in the name of Jesus. But a person cannot receive the Holy Ghost until they repent. Because the Spirit of God will not come in an unclean vessel. It's got to be clean. And the only way we can get it clean is get it washed out through repentance. And then we need to get those sins washed away so the Spirit of God can come and inhabit. Uh, we see that both repentance and baptism are necessary for redemption. You know, a person's flesh and nature often is drawn to rituals and uh, those uh, eagerly substituted uh, ceremonies, but they will not take the place of genuine repentance. Nothing can su substitute for genuine, true repentance. Water baptism is for the remission of sin. It should follow the genuine repentance in a person's life. It's the expression of godly sorrow and contrition over one's past sins. Water baptism can never be substituted for repentance. Repentance is not church membership. You know, people, uh, how many of you want to join the church? Come up and lie in the front. And then the pastor and the deacons and the elders will go through and shake their hand. Now, uh, come back and we'll have a signing ceremony. Sign here on the dotted line. This is a, the official church roll book. Now you are officially a member of whatever church. But just because you have your name on a roll book, you can have your name on a hundred roll books. But guess what? If your name is not on his roll book, the Lamb's book of life, I'm sorry, you just have your name on another book. Because our book, their book, is not going to stand in the place of judgment of his book. That's why it's important that we have our name written in his book. Uh, the North American religious culture today sadly emphasizes church membership over spiritual change. Uh, many will misconstrue this by taking on the first step toward God. Uh, some churches measure their success by how many names or how many numbers of names are on their attendance roll. They do not emphasize Sadly to say, repentance, looking for an outward and inward change of heart. And some of these, sadly to say, they don't even practice repentance at all. The same fleshly tendencies that control believers before they receive the Holy Ghost. Guess what? Still, I try to tempt the believer. Uh, Many people have claimed church membership, but they have never repented of their sins. Until an individual repents, he can never experience salvation. Church membership is no substitute for repentance. Luke chapter 13 and verse 3 says, I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all. He didn't single out just one or two people. But he said, Ye shall all likewise perish. Repentance is not education. Your education is vital. Education is important on each person's personal growth. Now, when I talk about education, I'm not talking about the secular education of going through kindergarten through uh, four or nine years of university studies. I'm talking about personal growth in the Word. You know, we need to be in the Word. We need to be educated. We need to know what the Word says. Even Paul told Timothy, study to show yourself approved, not to man, but unto God. A workman who needeth not be ashamed, but rightly dividing the word of truth. 
Praise Ooh, God. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. So, you know, that personal growth is not a substitute for repentance. I know a lot of people, even atheists I've heard of, that can quote the word of God from cover to cover. That they can quote it back and forth. You know, that they, they know the word. But just because they know the word, it's not in their hearts. It, just because they have an understanding of the word doesn't mean they have a revelation of the word. See, God will honor education in a person's life and use it for his glory. But that individual must submit himself or herself fully to God. A person with education cannot bypass, nor should they or can they neglect repentance. The scriptures demonstrate through the conversion of Paul of Tarsus that I spoke about this morning. Paul, guess what? Or Saul from Tarsus before his conversion. Just because he was a learned man, he sat at the feet of a very scholarly professor. He understood all of 613 laws of thou shalt not. He understood the, the Ten Commandments that are not Ten Suggestions. Paul understood all this. Paul, or Saul at this time, was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He had a place in the synagogue where he was able to teach the law. And, he, and you had to really have a, you know, a, a 4.0 average. You had to be at the top of your class. You had to be at the top of your game to be able to sit in this in the place to give instruction. And Paul sat there. Paul knew what it was. And yet we see that uh, as Saul, I'm sorry, in Acts chapter 9, he was highly educated and he had a relationship with the Lord, but it was not a correct relationship. But when Jesus was ministering, he ministered to the very educated people. He spoke to them of their need to repent. Remember Nicodemus? Nicodemus was also a rabbi. Nicodemus was also a person of the religious realm. Nicodemus was also a follower of Jesus afar off. He was not one of these people that was well known during the daylight to be a follower of Christ. We see that Nicodemus came to Jesus by night. But so we see that even when Jesus spoke to uh, these educated people, he also told them the importance that they need to repent. In Luke chapter 13 and verse 4 and 5, Jesus stated, All those 18 upon whom the tower of Salom fell, slew them. Think ye that they were sinners above all men that dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you, nay, except ye repent, you shall likewise perish. When Jesus sent his disciples into the cities to preach, Jesus emphasized to those disciples the importance of repentance. In Mark chapter 6, verse 11 and 12, Jesus said, And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear you, when you depart thence, shake off the dust under your feet for a testimony against them. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. And they went out and preached that men should repent. Uh, when social or educational status does not matter. Individuals everywhere, when they approach God, they approach Him in the same manner, the same level, and it's through repentance. Oh, hallelujah. And our sixth one, 
And I'm going to close with this one tonight. Repentance is not faithfully attending church. As much as the Word emphasizes faithfulness and attendance of church worship, as much as I believe in faithfulness in church worship, because it is vital to our ongoing relationship with Jesus Christ. The scriptures command that faithful attendance, but it does not take the place of repentance. Paul wrote of the need to faithfully attend services, forsaking not the, the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. What day is he talking about approaching? Well, the evil day that's coming upon us. But it's not that we're focusing on the evil day. But what about the day of the Lord? The day of the rapture. We need to focus upon our relationship with the Lord and as we worship Him. It would be a wonderful, glorious uh, service to be in an apostolic Pentecostal service with everybody rejoicing and the trumpet of the Lord sounds. And the redeemed are gathered home. Oh, hallelujah. We just go from this church service to another church service. Hallelujah. Faithfully, attending church service affords fellowship and many opportunities for personal uh, growth that is possible only after a person has experienced true repentance in his heart. Now, repentance marks the personal decision of an individual to turn from sin and turn to God. A healthy church atmosphere tremendously helps one to get into a place of repentance. But nothing can take the place of the very act of repentance. Repentance can take place anywhere. A person can be on the city transit bus and repent of their sins. A person can be in a car and the Spirit of God move upon them and a spirit of repentance can move into that vehicle where they have to pull off the side of the road and they can repent of their sin. But the Spirit of God moves on a person and it's not only at a church service. But repentance is necessary. Hallelujah. We have to have faith in God. We have to have faith in His Word. And then we have to start with the basic first step toward heaven, and it is through repentance. Oh, hallelujah. Sincere, genuine repentance. Hallelujah. Let's all stand tonight. Hallelujah. And next week, we'll get into what repentance is. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's just love the Lord. To trust in Jesus. Just to take it. At His very words. Just to rest. Upon His promise. Just to know.